Welcome to another Drug Chug episode, and today we're going to talk about direct thrombin inhibitors like the Bigatran and how they work. In this video, we'll talk about everything you need to know about these direct thrombin inhibitors. So let's get into it. So here's a quick breakdown of everything in this video. There'll be timestamps down below, and at the end, we'll have a short quiz to see what we retain. Okay, to first understand this class of drugs, we need a quick overview. So the direct thrombin inhibitors, you need to know that they're anticoagulants. And that just means they stop and prevent blood clots from forming in the body. Now, there are two main direct thrombin inhibitors. And here we have dabigatran, which is brand name Pradaxa. And then we have something called Argatroban, which actually doesn't have a brand name. And it's actually an injection. With the injection side, there's also three other ones called Leperudin, Desirudin, and Bivalarudin. But I only want to focus on Dabigatran and Argatroban because those are the ones you'll most likely see. So if we take a look at Dabigatran, what's unique about Dabigatran is that it comes in oral capsules. So we could dispense this to patients so that they could just take it orally. Now because of that, it's also referred to as a DOAC or a direct oral anticoagulant. And this is also true with the factor 10A inhibitors we talked about in the previous episode, if you're following the course. Now on the right side, these are all injections, right? So the Argatroban, Leperudin, Desirudin, Bovalarudin, they're all infusions. And although they're not oral, we still refer to these as direct thrombin inhibitors because they all work the same way. The only difference is that the Bigotran, you could take orally, everything else has to be an infusion. So as a quick overview, all of these drugs are anticoagulants because they stop or prevent blood clots. But out of them, only one is oral and the others are infusion. Now that we've had a quick overview, let's go a step deeper and figure out how these direct thrombin inhibitors actually work. Let's see what their mechanism of action is. And to do that, we need to talk about the clotting cascade because we're talking about blood clots. And all the clotting cascade does is if you have a paper cut or you're bleeding, all it does is it makes you not bleed. And it's very complicated and we've gone through this several times, so I'm going to give a quick overview. And essentially what happens is you have a bunch of clotting factors. And you have the intrinsic pathway, which is damage on the inside, and you have the extrinsic pathway, which is having damage on the outside. And all these clotting factors activate each other until we hit the middle, which is the median pathway. And here we have clotting factor 10 that activates clotting factor 2 and then activates clotting factor 1. It's important to know that clotting factor 1 is the whole point of the clotting cascade because clotting factor 1 is fibrin and we need fibrin to make blood clots. So here, blood clots equal platelets, which are circulating in our blood, plus fibrin. So where does the bigotran really work? Well, clotting factor 2 is also known as thrombin. And earlier we said these drugs are direct thrombin inhibitors. So if we have a patient like this one here and we dispense them the bigotran and they take it, essentially what happens is the bigotran will block clotting factor 2, also known as thrombin, which will eventually lead to blocking fibrin. And then if we block fibrin, we block blood clots. And that's exactly how this drug works. All right, so now that we know how dabigatran and these other direct thrombin inhibitors work, let's talk about when we actually use them. If a patient has atrial fibrillation, meaning the atria or the top part of the heart isn't pumping correctly, this could lead to poor blood circulation. If there's poor blood circulation and that blood stays in the same area, it could lead to a blood clot. Now, this is specifically for non-valvular AFib. So if a patient has a prosthetic valve implanted, we can't use the Bigotran. We'd have to look for other products like Warfarin. 
We could also use it if a patient has a deep vein thrombosis. So this is a blood clot, usually happening in the deep veins, like in the leg. And we actually have two uses. We could either have a prophylaxis dose, meaning they don't have the deep vein thrombosis yet, but they're at risk. Or they currently have the deep vein thrombosis at this time, and we need to treat it. The same thing is true for a pulmonary embolism. So this is a blood clot traveling to the lungs. And this is a very serious condition. And same thing, we have a prophylaxis dose, meaning they don't have it yet, but they're at risk. Or a treatment dose, meaning they have the blood clot right now and we need to treat them right now. We could also use these drugs after surgery. So if a patient has a knee replacement surgery or a hip replacement surgery, we could prescribe them these drugs so that as they're recovering, a blood clot doesn't occur because of the stress a surgery could have on a body. Now, there's one unique thing I want to talk about here, and it's heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which means if a patient was on heparin, and heparin's usually used during surgery, they have this condition where the body attacks the platelets. It's complicated, but essentially it's kind of like an autoimmune disease it, temporarily, and the body is just constantly attacking the platelets. So what happens is the platelets drop down, and the patient is in critical health. They could bleed out like crazy. So to prevent this, we actually use Argatroban. So if the patient has HIT or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, typically the go-to is Argatroban. So now that we know when to use these drugs, let's talk about the dosing a little bit. So let's start with the Bigatran, and the brand name is Pradaxa. And here we have to be mindful of creatinine clearance, so we have to know how well our patient's kidneys are working. So for dibigatran, if a patient has AFib, it's real easy. We give them 150 milligram capsules twice a day. If they have a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism, same thing. We give them 150 milligrams capsules twice a day. Now, if we want to do prophylaxis of a DVT, meaning they don't have a blood clot, but they're at risk, let's say it's after surgery, then we drop them down to 110 milligrams within the first four hours after surgery, and then we give them 220 milligrams once daily for the next 10 to 14 days, depending on the type of surgery. Now, we said that the kidney function is important. So, if a patient's creatinine clearance is more than 50 milliliters per minute, you don't need to worry. There's no adjustment. Now, if the creatinine clearance is between 15 and 30, we have to drop it down. So instead of 150 milligrams twice a day, it drops down to 75 milligrams twice a day. So the dosing's not too bad. So now when we look at our Gatraban, it's a little different. This is weight-based dosing. And remember, we use this for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And the way it works is we have an initial dose of 2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And it's a continuous infusion. And essentially, we're monitoring the patient to see their platelets come back up. And then we adjust accordingly. Okay, so now that we know how these drugs work when we use them, let's talk about some clinical pearls and side effects. So the first one here is there are no routine blood tests, which is a good thing. Unlike warfarin, where you have to check the INR every week to every four weeks, dabigatran and these other direct thrombin inhibitors don't need routine labs. The next thing here is it works fast. It works on thrombin specifically the activated form of thrombin. So we don't have a delay, just like how we saw in warfarin that there was a delay. Here there is not. Then we see kidney function plays a role in our dosing. Usually under 50 creatinine clearance is when we would take a look at adjusting the dose. And then with all our anticoagulants, we know there's a bleeding risk. If we give a patient too much, we could push them to bleed more, and that's something we don't want. Now with dibigatran, 
there are three big things you need to know, and this is high yield information. And we said the bigotran was our only oral direct thrombin inhibitor. The first thing is that it's a very large pill and it's actually hard to swallow. And the issue is that you can't crush this pill at all because it'll damage the drug. So think about it. If a patient has a stroke, a blood clot, and it's hard for them to eat or drink already, it might be hard for them to take this medication twice a day, especially since it's so large. The second thing here is that you're not allowed to use a pill box to organize your medication. A lot of patients that have many medications on board will use a pill box to stay organized. But the problem with the Bigotran is that the medication needs to stay in the original container or blister pack. And the reason is that this vial has a special desiccant that's built in to absorb all the moisture so that the drug doesn't degrade or break down. Even in the original container, this drug expiration date's only four months. So we have to be very cognizant and look at these drugs and not let them expire because they're very sensitive to moisture. And the last thing here is that it has an antidote the antidote's name is Praxbind, and then the generic is a monoclonal antibody, and it works only with the Bigotran, and it works fast. All right, we made it to the end, so let's have a quick summary of everything we learned. So we talked about all our direct thrombin inhibitors. We had the Bigotran, Argatraban, Leperudin, Deserudin, and Bivalarudin, but we only focused on the Bigotran and Argatraban. Out of all of these, only this one here has an antidote, and that was a dabigatran, and the name of that antidote was Praxbind. So then we talked about how these direct thrombin inhibitors worked, and we talked about the clotting cascade, and we talked about how these clotting factors activate each other. So we said that clotting factor 10 activates clotting factor 2, which then activates clotting factor 1, which is fibrin, and then we know that blood clots are made out of platelets, and fibrin. So when a patient takes a drug, we block clotting factor 2, which is also known as thrombin, which blocks fibrin, which blocks fibrin in the making of blood clots, lowering the blood clot creation. So now that we know how it worked, we talked about when we actually use them. If a patient has AFib, a DVT, a pulmonary embolism, or after surgery, and then we also talked about Argatraban specifically if a patient has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And that was when a patient was on heparin during a procedure and essentially the body attacks the platelets, making them dangerously low. Then we focused on the Bigotran because that was our only oral direct thrombin inhibitor. And then we had a few caveats here. We said that it was a very large pill that you can't open, crush, we also said you can't put it in a pill box because it's got to remain in its original container. And then again, we said this is the only one that had an antidote. And that's it. So let's take a short quiz to see what we retain. All right, question one. Which of the following comes in an oral dosage form? Question two. Which clotting factor does the Bigotran block? Question three, what is the dosing to treat AFib with dabigatran? Question four, what is the name of the antidote used to reverse dabigatran?